Hello, this is Representative Pam Powers Hanley. Welcome to my podcast, A View from the Left Side. For many years in the Arizona House, my seat was on the far left side of the chamber. As a progressive Democrat and one of the most independent representatives in the House, I always believed that that was a fitting seat for me. This podcast features in-depth interviews with newsmakers from all walks of life, as well as political and social commentary. Thanks for joining me on the left side today. And now it's time for some good trouble. This week's A View from the Left Side Commentary. This week's podcast was recorded during the week of August 30th, 2021. In early August, a friend of mine invited me to like a Facebook group entitled Stand Against Barstool Sports Rape Culture. It didn't take much digging to figure out why my friend Kat Stratford had created this group. Barstool Sports founder David Portnoy has quite the internet rap sheet when it comes to sexist behavior and raunchy misogynist comments against women. With boobs, butts, beers, and blackout parties, Portnoy built the bro culture and barstool sports. What started as a Boston fantasy sports and gambling newsletter and blog has become a multi-million dollar multimedia sports, pop culture, and gaming conglomerate. What's the Tucson angle to this story? On July 27, 2021, Portnoy announced on Twitter that the University of Arizona had offered him a unicorn deal by choosing Barstool Sports as the new naming sponsor of the heretofore lackluster Arizona Bowl, which is played at Arizona Stadium on New Year's Eve. They will not only get the multi-year naming rights and privileges and notoriety through the Barstool Sports Arizona Bowl, the deal with the University of Arizona also gives Barstool Sports exclusive broadcasting rights to the game. Bye-bye, CBS TV. Portnoy said it all in his July Twitter video. After profusely thanking the University of Arizona, he said, quote, We are not just sponsoring a bowl game. We control everything. The bowl, the broadcast, the halftime show, the national anthem. We're getting into the live sports broadcast game. You know what that means? The moon is just a little bit closer. We're starting to take over everything. If you don't see the significance of this, you have a pea brain. End quote. I totally see the significance of this. But wait, there's more to this story. Exactly one month later, on August 27, 2021, the Arizona Department of Gaming announced 18 of the state's sports betting licenses and their corporate sports book partners. Phoenix Raceway was awarded one of the online sports betting licenses, and Barstool Sports is their partner. This contract allows Barstool Sports to run bets on the Barstool Sports Arizona Bowl game during the game, along with running bets on many other games, of course. Now that the state has announced 18 of the 20 new licenses, online sports gambling and fantasy sports gambling are scheduled to start in Arizona with the beginning of the NFL season on September 9, 2021, which is next week. HB 2772 legalized online sports betting and created a new agreement with the Native American tribes to allow some off-reservation gambling. Of the 20 new online gambling licenses, tribes will get 10 and established sports teams or sports venues will get the other 10. But wait, there's more. Immediately following the announcement of the 18 licenses, two lawsuits were filed against the state to stop implementation of HB 2772, an app-based sports betting in Arizona. 
the Yavapai Prescott tribe objects to off-reservation gambling and says that 2772 is unconstitutional. The casino gambling agreement between the state and the tribes was created by a citizen's initiative. Turf Paradise, the giant horse track in Phoenix, is also suing the state, but they want a license, and that's why they are suing. This is not a simple story about Portnoy, the feisty shock jock blogger who made it big using sex to sell the bro culture and his business. This is a much bigger story when you consider that app-based gambling is being passed by states one right after another. Billions will be made on gambling across the country. And every dollar that is made in gambling is a dollar that's lost by somebody else in gambling. Buckle up for a wide-ranging discussion about sexism and misogyny in sports, the bro culture, and the looming explosion of gambling in Arizona when online sports betting begins. Kat Stratford is my guest today. She's a single mom and a local activist who has spent the past two years working to promote policies that benefit survivors of sexual and domestic violence. Bro culture is nothing new. Drinking, gambling, carousing, telling raunchy jokes, objectifying and judging women, using sex to sell products. All of this, unfortunately, has been entrenched in American culture for a very long time. The way I see it, David Portnoy used a tried and true model to build Barstool Sports into a multi-million dollar multimedia sports, pop culture, and gaming conglomerate. Barstool Sports now has naming and broadcast privileges for the Arizona Bowl, and their partner, Phoenix Raceway, now has one of the coveted online gaming licenses for the state of Arizona. I think the rest of us should brace ourselves for an explosion of gambling and the bro culture in Arizona. What do you think, Kat? Well, I think you're completely right. There are only 10 gaming licenses available to professional sports venues, and one of those 10 has been granted to Barstool Sportsbook, their partner um, at the racetrack. As we know, they traffic in racism and misogyny, and I look forward to seeing a lot more of that. Gaming is going to be everywhere. I mean, Barstool Sports and Phoenix Raceway are only one combination. There's going to be up to 20 licenses. I see this as a as a huge proliferation of men behaving badly, perhaps. And it's not just going to be men who are going to be gambling. But if you see the ads that are already out there on Twitter, there's definitely a demographic that they are aiming for as far as their target uh, clientele. Yeah, their clientele, like, particularly with Barstool Sports, like, They've openly said who their clientele is, what demographics they're aiming for. There's a reason they have half of their pages dedicated to sexy pictures of co-ed, why they have riveting gays. Guess that ass. You know who their demographic is. They're aiming uh, for men between the ages of 18 and 25. They are notorious for throwing blackout parties near or on college campuses, um, where the goal is to get blackout drunk. They've also openly stated that uh, six passes out at a blackout party, that's really a gray area. It's openly promoting race at that point. I, I have seen those comments online, and it, it's pretty disturbing. He built this persona of the raunchy El Presidente, I think he calls himself. I don't know, it's disheartening for me that we're still sort of fighting the same battles, you know, decades later against sexism and sex cells. Sorry, it's already everywhere, but I guess I see it as getting massively worse, you know. The other thing that I find really interesting about uh, Barstool Sports is that there are a number of women involved in the corporation now. The CEO is a woman and many of the podcasters that are part of the media group that is Barstool Sports are also women. And it's it's shocking to me, I guess, that they're helping to build the empire this way. In terms of David Portnoy's persona that he's developed, I think it's like really kind of funny that he goes with El Presidente and honestly trafficking in this like Trumpian persona, like super narcissistic, very misogynistic, racist, grab him by the pussy, but with sports. 
as far as like the women involved, like at, at a certain point, it feels like tokenism because like every time somebody lobs an accusation of sexism on misogyny at Barcel, the instant response is, no, we have a woman CEO. We found somebody who will participate in her own oppression. Great. And then the blogs, if you check them out, one of their most popular blogs is really not like other girls, just like active participation in, in these stereotypes and being like, I'm not like other girls. I cast fish with my bare hands and drink beer with boys and I don't have any female friends. The culture and the idea behind female driven blogs is actually just more sexism in a different outfit. When I was first starting to do my internet research about barstool sports, I always look for long string Google searches, right? So I typed in barstool sports and then I saw what things come up that people are searching for, right? And the first search was barstool sports girls. And so I thought, okay, well, I'll click on that. And then you get the boobs, butts, and bikinis, right? You get the Instagram and all the photos and things like that. But then there are questions like, what happened to so-and-so? And that's when I realized that these were women podcasters on the Barstool Sports site. So then I really went down the rabbit hole into these podcasters. They're making a lot of money at this. One of the women that they were asking what happened to her, she had a tiff apparently with Barstool Sports and took her podcast, Call Her Daddy is the name of the podcast, took it over to Spotify for like $60 million. And so although there seem to be somewhat selling out, the women are really cashing out on uh, selling out. Barstool does point to the female-driven podcast and see the fact that the CEO is a woman as like a more totally not sexist we have females working for us and it's like but you actually are like I mean you literally have a game called Death That Ass on your website like you made these comments openly promoting race and rape culture like these are all actively sexist things so please don't tell me that it's not sexist just because you have female employees who, by the way, are obligated to sign contracts stating that they, like, I don't know if this is actually, like, could even legally hold water, but they are still required to sign contracts stating that they um, will put up with off-color humor, racism, sexism, like, everything that bar school is, they have to agree that they're totally cool with. And those are the contracts that they sign. I actually have the exact wording. There's also been charges of racism against Barstool Sports. Isn't that correct? Yes, that is very much the case. More recently, in response to accusations of racism, they had a podcast that was literally just the N-word. It was some kind of acronym that actually spelled out the entire racial epithet. Great job, Barstool. The, The problem is that so much of this, the sexism and sometimes the racism also, it is glossed over with the boys will be boys. This is locker room talk. What's the big deal? And I don't think that that's fair. Some of the drama that's going on here in Pima County is related to the Pima County Board of Supervisors voting with an overwhelming majority to pull their support from the Barstool Sports Arizona Bowl. What do you think about that? I mean, I really applaud the Board of Supervisors for taking that stand against Barstool and against Arizona Bowl. I'm disappointed that there was even one vote that was like, yes, we're using taxpayer dollars to subsidize this event. More funding pulled as a result of this. I'm still very hopeful that Arizona Bowl is going to reverse their decision to have this partnership because I really do feel like present clear and present danger to women on campus because they are going to be hosting parties. You can't tell me that at least one woman is not going to get hurt at this event as a result of the culture that Barstool is bringing into the U of A campus. Already, their athletics department has a problem with addressing sexual assault when it comes to people who are members of their athletic team. No accountability when there is a sexual assault accusation against an athletic, uh, an athletic team member. Yes, and that that's a pr- another pervasive problem and another part of the bro culture, right? Not only the barstool sports fans, once they get drunk enough or entitled enough, but also there are athletes 
who behave badly on multiple levels with women or even just degrading women or acting out completely and raping or having some sort of violence towards women. It's an escalating problem. And the entitlement that makes men think that they can get away with this is really dangerous. Another part that I wanted to address uh, besides uh, Pima County, and I was I was very proud of Pima County for taking that decision. I was kind of shocked at the University of Arizona, and I didn't really get a clear picture from the news stories that I read exactly how the decision is made. In the past, we had Nova Home Loans, Arizona Bowl. And so I was kind of surprised that they would jump to something like Barstool Sports. And then when they were asked about it, the head of the Arizona Bowl said, well, we got lots of publicity when we announced it, way more publicity than the Arizona Bowl ever got when people were actually watching it on CBS TV. And so this is like a whole new wave because Barstool not only gets the naming rights, they're getting the broadcast rights for multiple years. And then with the gaming licenses, they're going to have gambling on top of it. And so this is huge. And I don't think that a lot of people really understand how much the state of Arizona is going to change if all of this starts on September 9th. Uh, HB 2772, which was passed by the legislature in the spring, initiated these 20 licenses, including gambling off the reservation. Gambling is going to be everywhere, in my opinion. I was one of the few people who voted against it. All of the Mormons and a handful of Democrats voted against this. And I was very concerned about the public health impact of gambling. For every dollar that is won, there is a dollar that's lost by somebody. And gambling has ruined people's lives, taken their families, taken their homes. It has increased increased domestic violence, drug addiction. There's lots of things wrong with gambling. Seeing the state of Arizona just whole hog embrace this with blinders on, in my opinion, is a very dangerous situation, you know? So not just women who might get hurt during the game or during those parties, but afterwards when their partners have lost the rent money. And and then what do they do? What do you think about the long-term ramifications? I don't necessarily share all of the concerns with with the moral aspect of having gambling in the state, um, just because I I tend to have very liberal views on that, and I think people do have the freedom of choice, just, just like they do when it comes to um, recreational use of marijuana or drinking and all of that sort of thing. Those things are legal. That I I really do share. The tribe concerns when it comes to this, there is an active lawsuit. The, the Yavapai Prespa Indian tribe has brought a lawsuit stating that this is unconstitutional, that it's not fair, that tribes were strong armed into signing this gaming compact. And I think that there's some validity to that because only tribes that signed the compact would be eligible for one of these 10 tribal licenses. Now, there are 21 tribes that could be eligible for this license, but less than 50% of them will get it. And it's worth noting that there is a $100,000 non-refundable application fee that tribes will have to pay for an, for a license that they probably won't get. We should be considering the, the impact that this is going to have on tribes that have been marginalized for years and years and years. Um, in the past, the gaming compacts have always been with an eye on making sure that the benefits go to the tribes. And in this case, it looks like we are going to be enriching David Portnoy, who is definitely not indigenous. Um, he is just a very rich white guy who's going to be made much, much richer while also endangering women on campus. And it comes at the expense of some of these tribes. And I think that's really worth looking at. They are going to be holding an emergency hearing this Friday, September 3rd, um, where they're going to be hearing those concerns. And I'm very much hoping that they are going to find in a way that benefits Indigenous people because it does look like there is a discrepancy. According to lot of Tribe 10 game is going to be exclusively on mobile app where uh, professional sports and who are granted these licenses will be able to game on mobile app and in brick and mortar locations. And this seems particularly odd because, you know, the casinos are brick and mortar locations that apparently won't be able to use those locations, which shuts a lot of people out. 
Yes, that is one of the reasons I was against 2772, because I didn't think the tribes were getting a good deal. Senator Celian Gonzalez, who is a Yaqui, she was she also didn't think the tribes were getting a good deal, because as you said, there's more than 20 tribes, but there was only going to be 10 tribal app licenses. And I think that those app licenses are going to be in direct competition with the brick and mortar casinos. And so one of the parts of the Yavapai Prescott lawsuit is that they don't like the expansion of gaming beyond the reservation. And I agree with them on that. The other thing that they have in there is that because Ducey and the powers that be in gaming in Arizona want the online gaming to start with the start of the NFL season on September 9, which is next week, they put an emergency clause and And what the Yavapai Prescott tribe is saying is that that's not an emergency, right? That this should not start right now. And the other court case that's going on is completely different because that is Turf Paradise, uh, the horse track, that wants one of those licenses. Now, 18 of the 20 have been awarded. So there's two more to go that have not been announced. But uh, I totally agree with you. The Citizens Initiative that created the Indian gaming in the state of Arizona was established on helping the tribes and there are symbiotic relationships with the way way the money flows back and forth between the tribes and the state. And it's a delicate balance. And there were people who were concerned that this expansion to these sports teams was going to upset that delicate balance. Yeah, I just think that the precedent has always been that gaming should benefit indigenous people. Like, they, they stated numerous times that they want to keep uh, gaming on the reservation. If that is the case, then it should not be enriching white-owned corporations. I think in the long term, it's going to hurt the Native Americans. I really do. But first of all, I see them aiming at young men with these gaming apps. And those guys, they're sitting on the couch playing video games. They're not getting up and going to the casino and gambling. And so this is going to meet them where they are, right? On the couch <laughs> with the video games. It's, so the only way that people are going to be able to watch the Arizona Bowl this year is through one of the streaming services offered by Barstool Sports, which means that anybody wanting to watch this show, anybody at all, it, we know it's going to be like a lot of young men, um, are going to be directed to Barstool streaming services, and therefore Barstool's comments, Barstool's ads for online gaming. Like all, all, of, all of their content is going to be right there. All of their ads are going to be right there. So it's going to like directly feed into our tools gaming license that they just want. I totally agree with you. And I think, as we said earlier, the target audience for Barstool Sports is these young men. And they also would perhaps will watch the bowl game. Although, you know, the Arizona Bowl traditionally has been sort of the has been in a way because it's a lower division, but adding, you know, the excitement, the raunchiness, the, quote, pop culture of barstool sports might pump it up a little bit in in interest. I also think it's going to rope these young men into gaming. It's going to be a really easy way to lose a lot of money as far as I'm concerned. It's basically a recruitment tool for online gaming. Because the only, like I said, the only way that you can watch the Arizona Bowl game is through barstool sports. So you are automatically, at their website, you are automatically seeing targeted ads for their online gaming. You are automatically seeing this misogynistic, racist content. Um, so it's honestly like, it's just a gateway for, <laughs> for all of these terrible things that we don't want to see our young men doing. We don't want to see people participating in race culture. We don't want to see um, people losing their their lives and their children and their online gaming like we don't want to see any of that and essentially what we have there is like this this gateway for exactly that recipe for disaster do you think that there is a possibility that the arizona bowl is going to change their mind about the sponsorship or is this a done deal they seem absolutely set in their ways however i'm still optimistic because Because they have the exclusive streaming rights and because they have obtained that gaming license, I think there's a case to be made for, like, there being a serious conflict of interest here. Um, I I would think, I would hope that there's there's something to be said for that because it should be a conflict of interest for a company to have, like, the exclusive streaming rights and be able to give these targeted ads. Like, I mean, anybody can see this coming from a mile away. 
Um, so I'm hopeful that there will be some kind of legal technicality that will, you know, override this decision. But the, the board itself seems absolutely dead set on this. Uh, they block people on social media if you have asked um, any questions. I have not gotten any kind of a response to the op-ed that I wrote. Um, they don't seem to be accountable for this decision at all um, and seem to be standing by it. What about the University of Arizona? It doesn't seem to be good for their brand either. It's terrible for their brand, I think. Um, and I, I'm very hopeful that the president of the university is going to speak out against this. Uh, but yeah, I'm hoping that they will like say, no, nope, you can't play the game here. If you if you want to have virtual sports, you can't be on our campus. I'm hoping that they will take that stance Specifically, like, just for women on campus. I mean, we already know that there is an epidemic of sexual assault on campus. One in four women on campus will experience sexual assault um, or physical harassment of some kind. And when we bring in bad actors like Barstool Sports, we increase that risk. Um, If you throw a rowdy football game into the mix where alcohol is being served, and I think it's really easy to predict how that's going to go. Definitely. And again, it's not it's not surprising and it's not uncommon. This has been going on for a long time. I remember being a co-ed at Ohio State after a game. You could easily get swept into a crowd and swept away into the bushes. I almost got kidnapped one night. That starts happening. People are way too drunk. Things get out of hand real fast. I share your concerns about this. That's about all of our time for today. Do you have anything else that you'd like to add? Like I said, if you had told me that I'd be talking this much about football like two months ago, I would have laughed in your face. I said none of this is particularly surprising. It is incredibly disappointing. But honestly, I just can see myself in the future, 80 years old, just holding a sign saying, I'm too old to still be protesting this shit. And that's how I feel. It's been decades since I've been protesting this stuff. And if you look historically in the United States, if you look at like the suffrage movement at the end of the 1800s and the beginning of the 1900s, one of the reasons that the women who were seeking the right to vote aligned themselves with prohibition was that it was the bro culture, right? Their husbands were going out and getting drunk and uh, either not going to work or spending their paychecks and coming home and beating up on their wives. And so it was it was self-defense that the the women reacted against the beer halls and the drunkenness of the men during that time frame. And here we're beating back the same type of behavior in a way. One of the reasons that nowadays we are, our polling places are typically in schools and churches is because before women obtained the right to vote, they were in those very beer halls. Yeah, there's a, there's a lot of history wrapped up in, in this in this bro culture. It's not a new thing. It's been along it's been around a lot longer than the word bro. <laughs> Yes, and I would think after the Me Too movement and all of the stories that have come out, that there would be some sort of awakening in the community. And with groups like Arizona Bowl and the University of Arizona, I'm glad Pima County pulled out of it. And I hope some other people take a look at this. I don't think it's a good trend. There are no guardrails pretty much on the the gaming and what goes on with that advertising. And there's very little help for people who do get entrapped in problem gambling with these apps. And so this is a cultural experiment we're going to be entering unless those court cases stop it at least temporarily. So stay tuned. This podcast is actually going to come out on Friday. And so we'll see what happens with those court cases later. So thanks for joining me today, Kat. Thanks so much for tuning in to A View from the Left Side today. If you enjoyed the show, please consider liking this podcast on social media and becoming a subscriber. This is Representative Pam Powers Hanley signing off. Until next time, please take care of yourself, stay healthy, and stay vigilant.